Welcome to part two of the endocrine system. Last time we talked about the hypothalamus and the pituitary, and in this installment of the lecture, you're going to hear about other um, areas that secrete hormones. And it gets a little muddier at this particular point in time because uh, the liver, for example, is considered to be part endocrine because it releases hormones, but it's also exocrine because it releases bile, and it is also a secretory, or it secretes things such as albumin. So it's not just an endocrine system or an endocrine gland or an endocrine organ. So we're going to get into uh, gray areas. Not only are there other endocrine glands, but some of the hormones are released in cyclic fashion. For example, women uh, to do their monthly cycle are going to have to have some hormones that are increased and some hormones that are decreased. There are some of the hormones that are released at night rather than during the day. So whenever you have a blood test drawn, they're going to have to note the time that they drew the blood and which test they're doing, of course. And then they're going to give you the results and say, this would be the results if this was drawn in the morning. This is the results if it was drawn in the afternoon. This is the results if it was fasting, if it's not fasting, and so on. So again, it gets a little more complicated. Another thing about the glands and the organs that make hormones is as you age, a lot of them atrophy. They shrivel up. So uh, we talked about the pineal gland or the pineal gland, and it is the one that releases melatonin. That's the, the one that we most think about. It helps us set our circadian rhythms, but after age seven, it starts shrinking. And when we talk about the thymus, we talk about it shrinking. Uh, the adrenals also shrink. Studies have found that the uh, pineal gland or pineal gland influences puberty when you go through puberty. So usually, usually puberty happens between the ages of 13, 14, somewhere around seventh grade usually. But we're finding more and more children going through puberty in, say, the third grade. So there's some concern about what's causing that to happen. Uh, Right now, a lot of people are, are upset about COVID, and they're stressed out about not being able to get outside, not being able to go out to sports, all of those things. Plus, just wintertime, unless you're into winter sports, you tend to stay inside. So we're seeing more depression, sleepiness, uh, irritability, and eating way too much, especially carbs. So... To counteract that, if you have exposure to bright light, just go outside, put a coat on, go outside and get some sunshine if you can. And if you cannot, then get a full spectrum light and that will help you with your seasonal affective disorder or your SAD. The thymus is also part of more than one system. So it does have an endocrine function because it does release some hormones, but it also is so important in the lymphatic system because it is part of the system that trains the T lymphocytes to be able to um, initiate the immune response. So it's really important in the lymphatic and the immune system also. The question that I have is, it makes these hormones, and they stimulate your lymphatic organs, and they uh, also uh, regulate the activity of your T lymphocytes. So you lose your thymus. That's what this word means, involution, as opposed to evolution or evolution. You, you lose it. It shrivels up, and you go away. So... How do old people have a, a, an immune system, even though they don't have a thyroid, or excuse me, a thymus gland? Now, when I talked about the adrenals, 
I said, they look like somebody took some chewing gum and parked it on top of the kidneys. And the thymus looks, somebody, looks like somebody took chewing gum and parked it on top of the heart. So it's kind of fun uh, when you look at it. To give you an idea about the shriveling up of the thymus, this is a young child. Here's the heart. Here's the thymus. Doesn't look like a piece of chewing gum parked on top of there. It looks like a huge thing, even larger than the heart. And here's your thyroid gland right there. Now come over here and look at an adult. Here's your thyroid gland. And look at the thymus. So small. The thyroid gland, not to be confused with the thymus, has two lobes, and it is reddish-brown because there's a lot of blood circulating through there. It is just an endocrine gland, so it doesn't have a lot of other things that it does, like the liver does and the thymus. It's pretty much just uh, making hormones for us. And we know the, the thyroid hormone we're going to talk about that. It's not actually one thyroid hormone. But we're also going to make sure that you know that on the back side of the thyroid is, are the parathyroids. And they also release hormones. So here's a picture of the thyroid right there. Here is a picture. If you took a slice of it and looked at it in the microscope... Anytime you see these little square cells, they're called um, cuboidal cells, you know that they're probably secreting something. And in this case, they're secreting a precursor to the thyroid hormone. So this area right here is just stored thyroglobulin. So it's not active yet. It doesn't act as a thyroid hormone. You just make it and store it in your thyroid. And then as you need it, then you can release it. And you do some um, chemical alteration of it to make it an active form. So the parathyroids are in the posterior or the back of the thyroid. And their job, the hormone that it releases, the parathyroid hormone, increases your calcium levels, it makes calcitrol, it does uh, absorbs, it causes you to absorb calcium, it keeps you from peeing it out, and it helps you put the calcium back into your bones. So if you're looking at the back of a person, notice the trachea doesn't extend all the way around. That's kind of an interesting thing. A lot of people don't realize that. But here's the back of the thyroid, and there are the parathyroids. So in the pictures, they always make them stand out now that we know that they're there. But if you were to slice through and take a section out of the thyroid, it would be really hard to find the parathyroids. It doesn't look that much different than this does. So that's one of the reasons they didn't realize when they were taking people's thyroid gland out that they needed to replace not only the thyroid hormone, but they also needed to replace the parathyroid hormone. Here's the adrenals. Again, looks kind of like somebody put a piece of chewing gum on top of the kidney. And if you cut open and look inside of it, you have one area on the outside, which we call the adrenal cortex or the cork, and then there's the adrenal medulla inside. And if you were to slice through like this, you would actually see layers. And if you were taking a, an endocrine class, an endocrinology class, then they would want you to know all of these zones or these areas and exactly what was going on in each of these zones. But since this is a, a, an anatomy class and we have one chapter covering all of the endocrine system, uh, I don't. I will not re require you to memorize that. If you remember in the nervous system, we talked about the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. And we talked about ganglion and 
in the adrenal medulla, you have both the endocrine function, but you also have ganglia of the sympathetic nervous system, which, remember, the adrenal medulla, adrenaline, which is actually epinephrine. When you stimulate the medulla, you're going to be releasing catecholamines, and that would be your epinephrine, your norepinephrine, and a little bit of dopamine. So I want to take a second and show you what those look like. Here's the chemical structure of the three catecholamines that we just talked about that are released by the adrenal medulla. Here's dopamine, and if you look, you have the uh, OH groups, and then this cyclic carbon ring, and this thing looks almost like a little roof right there, and look, that's dopamine. Here is the same OH, the same ring, the same little rooftop thing. Here's epinephrine, same OH groups, same circle, same housetop looking thing. So if you look at the difference between these, this one has an amino group right there, but it does not have an OH group right there. This one has the amino group. It does have the OH there. And if you go here, you have the OH you have the amino group, but you've also added a methyl group on there. So these things are, they can be converted into each other because they are so similar, but they have different effects in the body. So the lack of the OH right there is going to make this one act very much differently and fit in a different receptor than the norepi will. And this methyl group is going to make the adrenaline or the epinephrine work differently than the norepinephrine. To remember what catecholamines do, think about seeing that bear and being scared to death. Sympathetic is the fight or flight. So you are going to be more alert. You are getting your body ready to do something physical, to either beat up the bear or to run from it you're going to start getting fuel out there. You're getting glucose out there into the bloodstream. You are going to cause the liver to release glucose. You are going to inhibit insulin. So if you inhibit insulin, you're going to have sugar build up into the bloodstream. So you're going to have more sugar, more energy for whatever it is that you need to do that's got you all scared or stressed or worked up. It causes your muscles to use fatty acids instead of using glucose. Muscles can use different forms of food to, enter, to enter, energize them or to, to do the metabolic things it needs to do. But the brain needs glucose. So this way you've got more glucose that can go to the brain so you can think faster. It increases your blood pressure. It increases your heart rate. So anytime you hear the word sympathetic, just think of a bear and think of all the things that happen in your body. You are not worried about digesting your food. You're not worried about making pee. So that stuff, is you don't need that right now. You just need to be able to run from that bear. The cortex or the outside part, the cork of the adrenal gland is going to make your mineral, I cannot say this word, mineralocorticoids. So there's the word mineral and corticoids. And it will regulate the body's electrolyte balance. So we're going to talk about uh, aldosterone and um, other things in just a second. And then you have your glucocorticoids. These are the ones that are going to cause you to make more sugar available. And your androgens. So these would be uh, your testosterone, but the, you also have estrogen that's made by the adrenal cortex. So a good percentage, although not nearly half, of the uh, estrogen testosterone that you make is coming from your adrenal cortex. And of course, in guys, they're making testosterone in the testicles, and women are making uh, estrogen in their ovaries. So that's where the rest of the um, sex steroids come from. 
Here's a picture of some of your steroid hormones. If you remember from the chapter when we did the macromolecules and we talked about the fats and the lipids and carbohydrates, you should remember what the structure of cholesterol looks like. It looks, I call it chicken wire. It looks like this chicken wire. So your hormones, your sex hormones, as well as some of your other hormones, are made from cholesterol. So if you were successful in getting cholesterol out of your body, you wouldn't be able to make hormones, and you'd be uh, having all sorts of problems. Now, again, like the catecholamines, it can be converted into each other. These things can be converted into each other, too. So look at testosterone. Here you have a doubly bonded oxygen. Here's progesterone, uh, doubly bonded oxygen. Then there's the chicken wire, the, the cholesterol part right there. Here is the methyl group. Here is a methyl group. Here's a methyl group. Here's a methyl group. So the difference between testosterone and progesterone is this one has a hydroxyl group, an OH right there, and this one has a methyl out here and then a doubly bonded oxygen and a carbon right there. Now, looking at the difference between estrogen and testosterone, you have the cholesterol, of course, the OH, the OH, the methyl, the methyl. And this one, the testosterone has another methyl here that the estrogen is missing. And this one has, a, excuse me, hydroxyl on the end, and this has a doubly bonded oxygen. So they're very, very similar to each other and can be converted into each other. But again, you've got to have cholesterol as a building block. So here's aldosterone coming from the adrenal cortex. It helps you keep sodium. Retention means you keep it and you pee out your potassium. So if you have a problem with your aldosterone levels, you're going to be in trouble because you get enough salt, you get enough sodium in the food that you eat that you almost never run out of sodium. But most people are not getting enough potassium. And if your potassium drops below a certain level, your brain won't work, your muscles won't work. So that's not okay. So a problem with aldosterone could, could be uh, fatal if they don't catch it. So people with an aldosterone hyper secretion whether they're just over-secreting it or whether they actually have an active tumor that is secreting it, they're going to have to take potassium because they're going to pee be peeing out what potassium that they do eat. And if you start having leg cramps or eye ticks, a lot of times it's because you, you don't have enough potassium. So one of the things they do like at soccer games for little kids is they have breaks periodically and they give them oranges, things that are high in potassium, bananas. One of the first things that doctors will do when they find out that you have high blood pressure is they'll say, well, first thing we're going to do is you need to stop eating things that have sodium in them. Well, unless you happen to have a problem with sodium retention, because you have a problem with aldosterone, for example, then that's not what's causing your high blood pressure. So cutting sodium out of your diet isn't going to fix your high blood pressure unless you happen to have something that's causing you to retain sodium. Your kidneys are very efficient at getting rid of extra sodium that you don't need. So my suggestion, if they tell you to get your blood pressure down by cutting sodium out of your diet, try it. I mean, that's, that's why you go to the doctor, to take their advice. But if you cut sodium out of your diet and your blood pressure doesn't go down, there's something else causing it. When I think of glucocorticoids, I'm reminded of that uh, saying, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because you need them. Absolutely. They are your stress hormones. 
If you are stressed, if something horrible is going on in your life, if you are running marathons, if you are dealing with getting evicted from your apartment, things like that, the death of a loved one, you're going to secrete these things. And they're going to provide you glucose. You're going to have cortisol, the stress hormone. It will regulate the fat and protein catabolism. So you'll actually break down fats. You'll break down proteins. Remember catabolism, cats clawing things to pieces. So you're, this is, you're like, well, what's the downside of that? I'd love to get rid of some of my fat. That'd be great. But the problem is if you continuously or over secrete these glucocorticoids, it'll actually shut off your immune system. So the, the helping the body to adapt to stress, to help repair your tissues and all of that will actually shut off your immune system. So it's not good. This is why a lot of people, when their spouse dies, within a very short period of time, sometimes weeks, then the other spouse is dead. A lot of times when you are so stressed, then you start developing cancers. So look at whatever is stressing your life and see if there's something you can do to stop that stress before it knocks out your immune system and then you're in real trouble because you have cancer or pneumonia or something like that. I hesitate to even talk about this because I don't want to uh, put ideas in your head. But one of the things that they've done now is they have made testosterone a controlled substance. It's in the same category as narcotics so that if you were to get a prescription for testosterone, it would be the same thing as if you were trying to get opioids or something like that. Uh, because people abuse testosterone. It helps guys bulk up, and when women bulk up, makes you stronger. But if you take too much of it, it can hurt you. So they made it almost a criminal offense uh, to get testosterone. But the precursor, DHEA, which your, your body just takes and turns into testosterone, you can get over the counter anywhere. You don't need a prescription. So I always thought that was funny. But anyway, hopefully whoever decided testosterone needed to make, be made illegal uh, doesn't figure out that DHEA is the precursor. Estrogen, you do make some from your adrenals, but once a woman goes through menopause, her ovaries stop making estrogen. So about the only estrogen that a woman gets after menopause is what comes from the adrenals. And remember, the adrenals shrivel up, which is why most women have osteoporosis when they get older. This is what normal bone looks like. Most people don't realize it's kind of spongy looking. This is what osteoporosis looks like. You literally have eaten holes in the bone. So a lot of times people say, oh, my grandma fell and she broke her hip. And probably that's not true. Probably the bone dissolved away to the point where the bone broke. And because grandma no longer had a bone to support her, she fell down. Moving on to the pancreas, if you notice, a lot of people have been dying of pancreatic cancer, and it's getting a lot more attention. The problem with the pancreas is you don't feel the cancer until it's already spread through the pancreas and has metastasized to the rest of the body. So by the time you realize you actually have pancreatic cancer, it's generally too late to do much of anything for you. You can remove glands like the thyroid gland as long as you replace the thyroid hormone and the parathyroid hormone. 
and we still seem to be able to do things without our thymus if it shrivels up. But the pancreas does so many things that you really cannot live without your pancreas. You really have to have it. It has the digestive enzymes that help you break down your food. It neutralizes the stomach acid as it comes out so that you don't eat a hole in your intestines. And, of course, the most famous thing that most people think of when they think of the, the uh, pancreas is it has areas, they call them islets, that make insulin. Now, some people, when they get the flu especially, they're, when they're getting over the flu, they will attack not only the flu virus, but they'll attack the islets that are making the insulin. And so then they can no longer make insulin. So for the rest of their life, they're insulin dependent. Another hormone that your pancreas makes that almost nobody even knows that they make is called glucagon. And you know that the insulin pulls the sugar out of your bloodstream. So if you don't have enough insulin, they, the old people, they go, honey, I got me the sugar. And that means I've got too much sugar in my bloodstream. But they understand that they got the sugar and they have to have the insulin shots. You also make glucagon, which is the opposite. It does has the opposite effect. It puts glucose back into the bloodstream. So what happens to some people, especially you talk to people who are supposed to be dieting, and what happens is they go, I can't stand it. I get so hungry. I'm shaking. I'm miserable. So... I'm going to talk about people that are not diabetic. I'm going to talk about regular people because people who are diabetic have another problem going on. But just a regular person, they eat something and the body is stimulated to make insulin. The insulin goes into the bloodstream and it causes the sugar to be pulled out of the bloodstream. The problem is sometimes you pull too much sugar out. And as soon as you do that, you've got signals, chemical signals that go off in your body that goes, help, help, there's not enough sugar. We need sugar. So you interpret that as, ooh, I need to go eat something. And I can give you a classic example. Think about a Thanksgiving dinner where you've eaten until you're absolutely stupid. You cannot eat another bite. And then they bring out all the desserts. And you force yourself to eat a few more bites. And then you go watch a football game or take a nap or whatever. An hour or two later, you're hungry again. And you go, well, I think I'll go in the kitchen and have a little snack. You know, eat some of that. And you, you know in your mind there's no way you're hungry because you just ate like an idiot. All of that wonderful, wonderful food and all the desserts. So you can't possibly need food. But your body is telling you that you do. So if you'll wait about 15 minutes and just say, okay, I know better, I know I'm not hungry, then what will happen is glucagon will say, oh, there's not enough sugar in the bloodstream. Oops, we pulled too much sugar out. And it'll put the sugar back into your bloodstream. And then your body stops telling you that you're hungry. So, but most people, as soon as they get those hunger pangs, they're like, oh, Nope, I got to go eat something right now, even though they know they're not really hungry. Now, again, this isn't true for diabetics. Diabetics, if they get the wrong amount of insulin or if they take too much of the pills that they give you for type 2 diabetes that pulls the sugar out of your bloodstream, then you, you probably do need to go eat something rather than waiting for glucagon to kick on, kick in. So remember... Insulin pulls the sugar out. Glucagon puts the sugar back. So they're the opposite, but they're both made by the pancreas, which I think is kind of interesting. So insulin not only pulls the sugar out of your bloodstream, but it, it urges your muscles and your liver to make glycogen, which is just chains of glucose. If you were talking about those chains of glucose in a plant, you call it starch. 
but since we're talking about you as a human being, we call it glycogen instead. So you're, you're storing up the sugar. You are, unfortunately, storing fat. You're synthesizing and storing it and proteins. So insulin doesn't just pull sugar out of your bloodstream. Several places in your body, like your brain, doesn't need insulin. It will just absorb the glucose it needs. Your liver also can absorb glucose without insulin in your kidneys and your red blood cells. But all the other tissues in your body, you need insulin in order to pull the sugar in to make ATP and all the energy that you need inside the cells. So even if you were diabetic, your brain, your liver, your kidneys, and your red blood cells will still be absorbing glucose. But the rest of the tissues are the ones that you're, they're in trouble. So any of these uh, problems that you have with insulin, whether you're not making enough insulin or you don't have the receptors to respond to the insulin, we call it diabetes mellitus. Now, diabetes insipidus is a different situation. It has nothing to do with sugar. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, diabetes mellitus is type 1 and type 2 diabetes. We ran across the word somatostatin before. Somato means a body cell. And statin, stop. Right there, stop it. So somatostatin is going to stop the... Um, digestion and absorption of nutrients. It's going to suppress glucagon and insulin because both of those are dealing with putting sugar out of the bloodstream, putting the sugar back into the bloodstream. So it's going to stop them and it will give the body more time to absorb what nutrients are already there. If you ask someone what causes too much sugar in your bloodstream, almost every single person will tell you, oh, diabetes, uh, they don't have insulin. But if you look down here, here are some other things that will cause you to have too much sugar in your bloodstream. If you have a problem with glucagon, you're making too much glucagon. Remember, it puts sugar back out into your bloodstream. So they maybe need to check and see, are you hypersecreting glucagon for some reason? If you're making too much growth hormone, if you are stressed, epinephrine, norepinephrine, these are your sympathetic stressor um, compounds, cortisol, the, the stress hormone. So there are other things that can cause you to have high blood sugar. So we say they're hyperglycemic. Hyper means too much. And when you see this, you think about glucose. So too much glucose. If you do not have enough sugar in your bloodstream, there's usually one culprit. You are making too much insulin or in the case of diabetics, they try to guess how much carbs they're eating and how much fat they're eating, and they try to adjust the injection that they give themselves of insulin, and sometimes they give themselves too much, and it pulls their blood sugar way too low. So hypoglycemic, hypoglycemic, not having enough sugar in your bloodstream. And now we're going to talk about your gonads. So if you're a woman, we're talking about your ovaries. If you're a guy, we're talking about your testicles. And I remember one of my classes, and I heard a kid whispering to another kid, and they go, what are your testicles? And the other kid goes, it's your nuts. And it was one of those things where I'm not allowed to laugh, but oh my goodness, when I got home, I just cracked up. So your gonads are going to make steroid hormones. Remember, steroid hormones are forms of cholesterol. So the ovaries can make estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. And the testicles can make testosterone and estrogen 
as well as other androgens. And they both can make inhibit. So you already know that word means we're going to shut something down. I also mentioned that you can convert these into each other. So you've probably seen boys who are going through puberty and unfortunately, they make a little bit more estrogen than they do the testosterone until the testosterone catches up, and they'll actually grow breast. And that is so embarrassing, especially for, like, little seventh graders who have to shower with each other after P.E., and, of course, they're looking at each other, and they see, oh, my goodness, so-and-so has boobs, and it's so embarrassing. But over time... The, the estrogen will be overwhelmed by the testosterone and the breast will go away from the guy. But be sensitive if you have children and they're going through puberty to see if they are developing breasts and explain it's normal and it's a passing phase and the breast will go away. Now, in the case of women, as soon as they go through menopause, they are they stop making estrogen pretty much and but they still have testosterone some of which is being made by their adrenal glands and so a lot of times grandma will grow a, a mustache so grandma has to keep plucking or shaving to get rid of the mustache and the beard that come along so we all make estrogen and testosterone, but guys make more testosterone and girls make more estrogen. So one of the things that we were talking about in one of my classes was a movie that came out uh, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, and the, the name of the movie was Junior. And they were looking to see if a guy could be given hormone replacement and could carry a baby to term. So Arnold Schwarzenegger was the guy who carried a baby to term. And we talked about whether it was possible. Well, come to, th I mean, to, to think about it, women have a womb and women and men don't have a womb. So they don't have a place, they don't have a uterus for the baby to implant. But if you look in the literature, there have been cases where the egg and the sperm are fertilized in a woman and it doesn't make it into the uterus, it makes it into the abdominal wall. And the baby will actually attach to the abdominal wall and she will carry the baby to term outside the womb. Doesn't happen often, but it can happen. So if you stop and think about it, the, the science behind Junior could actually be where men could give birth. They'd have to have a cesarean because there wouldn't be any way to get out the, the baby. But anyway, if you need uh, a break from learning about this stuff, go watch Junior. The interesting thing in the movie was he had to get an egg from someone and then he used his own sperm to fertilize the egg out in a petri dish and then uh, Danny DeVito implanted the egg in his abdominal wall. Here's a picture of a woman's ovary and once a month in one of her ovaries she will have one of her eggs in a sack and the sack will fill with fluid and it will it will literally rupture and the woman if she is uh, attuned to her body and she knows it's time for her to ovulate or release an egg can actually feel the egg leaving because it's a little sharp pain but if you're not really thinking about it you have little sharp pains throughout the day that you just ignore but if you are wanting to get pregnant and you want to know when you release the egg, you can actually feel it pop. So this is a picture showing it popping. And the fluid rushes out and it pushes the egg across and over into the fallopian tube. So when we get to chapter, I think, 27, we'll talk more about this. But once the egg has left, 
then the sac that it was in becomes a corpus luteum, and it starts making hormones, and it will persist until the egg gets fertilized and implants, or the egg dies and the woman does not get pregnant. So you actually, women have a, a monthly hormone-making area called the corpus luteum, or the white body. That's corpus is body, and luteum is white. Then it's going to make hormones. So again, we'll talk more about that when we get into uh, sex ed. All right. So here's the slide talking about what I just said. The follicle becomes a corpus luteum. It makes progesterone, but it also makes inhibin. And inhibin blocks follicle-stimulating hormone. So this is to keep you from getting another egg to ripen. So this is why we only release eggs once every month. And We'll release one from one side and then release one from the other side. So it's rare for you to release more than one egg at a time. It runs in families, though, to have twins and triplets. So it can happen that you can have more than one egg uh, come to, uh, I call it ripening, getting ready to be able to be impregnated with a sperm. All right, uh, other things that the estrogen and the progesterone do is they get the breast ready for lactation, assuming you got pregnant. You don't want to make any more follicle, uh, you don't want to make any more uh, ripe eggs or mature eggs, so you need to stop that. You need to shut that particular process down. In order to make this particular part more interesting, I highly recommend you watch a Nova video called Miracle of Life. I always, if I'm teaching face-to-face, -face, we watch it. We watch it together because it's that important that I want my students to see it. You can go to YouTube and type in Nova, N-O-V-A, Miracle of Life, and watch. But it will actually show you inside the human body. This guy invented cameras that would fit inside the body. So he goes inside the penis and he's looking inside there. He goes inside the woman and looks inside there. He goes into the fallopian tube and he's actually filmed the egg being fertilized. He, he's filmed the egg coming down the fallopian tube. You can actually see it rolling down the fallopian tube, being pushed by the, uh, the cilia inside there. It shows it implanting in the wall of the uterus. It is amazing where he put the camera and the things that he filmed. But he even had microscopic cameras, so he was able to show nurse cells in the testicles, and they're taking care of the sperm. They help the sperm grow until they are mature enough to grow a flagella, and then they can go swim off and look for an egg. The nurse cells also make inhibin, which blocks the FSH, so you're not trying to make too many sperm at one time, more than the nurse cells could take care of. One more thing before I leave this slide. I would like to point out to you that until a boy goes through puberty and makes enough testosterone, he will not make um, sperm. You need the testosterone in order to make sperm. So sometimes your children are out playing and they play doctor and you think, oh my goodness, you know, what's going on out there? It isn't possible for a young child, a young boy, to have sperm and impregnate a female until he's gone through test, uh, excuse me, uh, through puberty and made enough testosterone in order to make the sperm. So I have parents ask me questions like that from time to time, and I hasten to reassure them. 
Now here's a picture that's interesting, but it's not nearly as cool as that Miracle of Life video. This is simply a cross section. They've just sliced through the um, seminiferous tubule that is, that is making semen. So what you're seeing here are going to be semen. They're going to be sperm, but they're not sperm yet. Here's a picture that I took using the electron microscope. And if you take the testicle and pull the seminiferous tubule, it almost looks like spaghetti. So you can pull out these, these strings like this. And then I wanted to zoom in on the end. And I couldn't find my picture, but I did find this one. And here are the cells that are becoming sperm right here. And there are their tails hanging down in the lumen of that spaghetti looking string that I showed you earlier. Going on to the skin, you don't really think of your skin as being part of the endocrine system, but the keratinocytes, which are one of the types of cells that lay down the keratin, like your fingernails and your hair, they can take um, cholesterol using UV radiation from the sun and turn it into cholecalciferol, which can be converted into vitamin D. So you literally can stand there in the sunshine and make vitamin D using the sun's energy. And a lot of people are really low on vitamin D right now because they haven't been outside because it's been winter and we've been uh, staying at home, sheltering at home. So they're not getting outside and getting enough sunshine. So we're having a lot of vitamin D deficiency going on right now. Then you talk about the liver. It has all sorts of hormones that it makes. One of them we talked about when we did the um, blood system is the liver makes erythropoietin, which stimulates the bone marrow to make erythrocytes or red blood cells. And it also has uh, the uh, inhibiting of the growth factor, controlling growth factor, and then you have this, which pre, uh, causes the intestine to absorb iron. So hepcidin promotes intestinal absorption of iron. Otherwise, you're going to lose the iron in your feces. And so you get iron deficiency anemia. So this is an important uh, hormone right there. So the liver makes about 15% of your erythropoietin. And... The other 85% is made by your kidneys. So between your liver and your kidneys, they are the ones who tell your body how much red blood cells you need. So if you don't have enough or you have too many, you got to look at the kidneys and you have to look at the liver to see who's uh, not doing their job correctly. Renin makes angiotensinogen converted to angiotensin. So we talk about hormones precursors, like when we were talking about the thyroid hormone. It's, it's actually made as thyroglobulin, and then later it is converted to thyroid hormone. And you make angiotensinogen, which is an inactive form. So when you're ready and you need it, all you have to do is just cut off a piece of it, and now you have angiotensin 1. And angiotensin 2 is created in the lungs, and we've talked about that because it is the ACE2 receptors that are inviting the COVID or the coronavirus into our lung cells and causing problems. So if we didn't have a receptor there that they like to go in to our cells, then we would not be having this problem that we're having right now. So here are some of the things. Uh, the kidneys finish converting the, the cholesterol that you had in your skin. They started the pathway to making the vitamin D. So you finally finish up in the kidneys, oddly enough. 
if you go into the other countries of the world, they're going to call sodium natrium. And you notice on the periodic table, the, the abbreviation for sodium is Na. So it is natrium. And the heart regulates, monitors how much sodium passes through. So if you are stretching the heart muscle too much, then you're going to be releasing a natriuretic peptide. So that's, there's natrium right there with the M off of it. So natriuretic peptide. And what it will do, it decreases your blood volume. It says, okay, you stretched me too far. There's too much blood. There's too much pressure. And so it tells the kidneys you need to get rid of sodium. You need to pee out the sodium. You need to pee out the water. And if you do that, it's going to lower your blood pressure. So the natriuretic peptide is the opposite of angiotensin. It's the opposite. So angiotensin causes tension in your blood. But natriuretic peptide lowers your blood pressure because you pee out the sodium, you pee out the water, and so you don't have as much volume, so you don't have the pressure. Your stomach, we're finding more and more hormones that are released by the stomach. So they just listed a few of them right here. A lot of their job is just to keep your intestines moving, keep the food going, keep the glands secreting. So that's a lot of what the stomach does is that. In the past couple of years, they've made a really exciting discovery. A lot of people can't lose weight. They just can't. Whether it's psychological, physiological, for some reason they can't do it. And it, it becomes so dangerous that their life is in jeopardy. So they will go in and do what they call bariatric surgery. Bariatric means super fat. Not just, not just I have a little bit of uh, fat on my leg that I would like to get rid of. It's like, no, no, you're so fat that you're having trouble breathing. You're having trouble getting blood through your body. So they can put a band around your stomach. They can tie off part of your stomach. Sometimes they actually remove part of it, but that's rather, that's extreme. They, they don't usually do that. But one of the things that they discovered in a lot of people who had type 2 diabetes, if they did this surgery to limit the amount of, of stomach available for food to go into, they cured their type 2 diabetes, like cured. You did the surgery, and the next day you weren't a type 2 diabetic anymore. So they, that was huge. And they started looking, what is it in the stomach that is causing people to be type 2 diabetic? And why does bariatric surgery fix it? So if you want to read some more about it, there's like gastric bypass cures type 2 diabetes 80% of the time. There is so much that we are learning about the endocrine system and all the different hormones, and we're constantly finding new hormones. So one of the hormones they found, fat tissue. Adipose tissue is fat. It secretes some hormones, one of them leptin, slows your appetite. So if the fat cells were already full of fat, then it would make sense that they would send out a hormone saying, okay, that's enough. We've got enough. You need to stop eating because we don't want to make any more fat. We don't have any room to store it. So leptin is a hormone that can slow your appetite. Your bones, osseous means bones, Osteoblasts are the cells in the bone tissue that make new bone. So osteoblasts make new bone. They also make hormones, and some of this hormone can 
actually cause your pancreas to grow new beta cells. And the beta cells are the ones that make insulin. So if you've got more cells, then you're going to be able to make more insulin. And they also increase the sensitivity of your body tissues to insulin. So the if we looked at this, we would find treatments for type 1 and type 2 diabetes because in the case of type 1, you lost your beta cells. You destroyed them. You thought they were foreign invaders, and you literally destroyed them. And in type 2, the body tissues aren't able to take the sugar up the way they should. So whether you don't have enough receptors or something. So this can increase the sensitivity of body tissues so that it will use the insulin to take up sugar. This same hormone inhibits weight gain. Everyone's always trying to lose weight and stops type 2 diabetes. So we're getting a handle on some of these things because everyone, it seems like my age, has type 2 diabetes. I mean, that's just the thing. And let's see, moving on. So we talked about fat tissue, bone tissue, the placenta. The baby makes the placenta, and it makes hormones it needs for its, it to grow. So it kind of takes over the mother a little bit and says, okay, we need to maintain this pregnancy, and we're going to need some hormones to do that, and I need certain hormones to develop. So I need you to make those for me, mommy. And your breast, your mammary glands, it sends the message to the mammary glands that I'm coming out in a little while and I want some milk when I get out there. So the baby, through its placenta, releases hormones. And one of the things I'm going to go ahead and tell you is a lot of times when a woman gives birth, so she's got this bag this placenta with a baby in it, and she gives birth. So the baby comes out. She's had this huge surge of oxytocin, which caused the baby to come out. And then right after she delivers the baby, she delivers the placenta, or the afterbirth. Some people call it the afterbirth. Suddenly, the baby is not providing hormones, Suddenly, the placenta isn't there anymore, and it's not providing hormones. And so she has kind of a hormone crash. So it is not at all uncommon for a woman, after she's delivered her baby, within a day or two, to go on a crying jag for no particular reason. They're just, they're just sitting there, and all of a sudden, they just cry and cry and cry and cry. And so I had already had a class like this before I had my first baby. So I warned my husband. I said, you know, now after the baby, I'll probably get kind of weepy. So don't, don't freak out about it. Well, when I had my first child, it was during a time where the textbooks said that mother's milk wasn't any good and that babies needed artificial formula because it had more of what the baby needed. So the nurses were instructed when the mother wanted to breastfeed the baby, take the baby, give it a bottle of something. If you can't give them milk, then give them water. But make sure that the baby's full before you bring it to the mother. And that way the mother, the baby won't nurse the mother. So that was actually a thing, and it's still some places they think that the mother's milk isn't any good because it isn't as thick, it's not as fat-filled as, say, cow's milk is. So I tried to nurse my baby, and I tried to nurse my baby, and he would not nurse, and I cried, and I cried, and I cried. And my mother-in-law was so upset. She goes, oh, my goodness, she's crying. What's wrong? And my husband just patted her and said, it's okay. It's called postpartum depression. It's perfectly normal, and she'll stop crying in a little while. And, of course, I got so mad, I wanted to beat him up at that point in time. But it wasn't until later that I found out why uh, that I couldn't breastfeed the baby while I was in the hospital. 
So we've talked about a lot of the hormones. Again, this is a whole course just on hormones that you can take if you want to take um, endocrinology. So there are others out there. I think it's fascinating to read and see how they interact with each other. But I've gone over the hormones that I want you to know about. And in our third and final section of the endocrine system, I'm going to talk about how they're made, how they're moved around in the body, how they act on target cells, and how do you get rid of them when you don't need them anymore. So we'll be talking more about how they work as opposed to which ones are they and what does it look like if you don't have enough or if you have too much.